All right. Thanks, everyone. Glad to uh, join you this uh, Wednesday at one. Um, what you can see here is our uh, expert panel, as we like to uh, refer to the team. Uh, I wouldn't call myself that, but um, you can see all the folks that are, are working behind the scenes to make sure that the PAYS is accurate, reliable, and delivered to all the participants in a timely manner. Um, so we just want to give a shout out to all of our team. Um, but today, if you want to flip, uh, we'll be led by myself. I'm Jeff Colchin. I'm a deputy director in charge of prevention initiatives at PCD, the Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And I also serve as the project leader uh, for the Pennsylvania Youth Survey. Uh, our, we're also joined by Mary Johnson, uh, who is our uh, survey guru, I guess you could call her, from Bach Harrison, who has been doing the PAYS uh, on behalf of Pennsylvania uh, students and schools since 2013. Uh, she is their director of survey services, uh, and it is a honor and a joy to work with her on a uh, daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. Uh, so real quick today, um, we'll go through kind of a current update as to where, where we are. Uh, we'll walk through the overall, uh, the overview of the profile report, and then a new document we have this year uh, that we were able to create and provide uh, for everyone that participated, uh, what we're calling an all grades, all data uh, trend report. So if you've participated, your school district has participated for the last three years, you'd be able to see all that data in a tabular form laid out uh, in an easily referenced uh, version um, that we hope will be useful. We'll look at some feedback, how we might be able to improve that uh, moving forward, but uh, we're excited to share that with the field as well. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what the trends are telling us. What we've seen from a quick uh, review of the reports, um, obviously the local reports just went out, as Sophia mentioned um, earlier this week, uh, so we don't anticipate anyone having uh, too many questions about exactly what their, their data is saying. But moving forward, we'll uh, share a link. If you do have questions or, or any sort of um, kind of scratching your head that you'd like us to help you with, we'll be able to do so. Okay, as Sophia mentioned, there's our first poll. <clears throat> One of the big things that uh, coincides with PAYS, uh, especially since the reports uh, from the 2021 administration uh, are now public and are uh, being analyzed uh, anxiously and, and eagerly, I think, by the field. Uh, Prevention Week is next week. This is the National Prevention Week um, identified by the Substance Abuse and Men Mental Health SAMHSA. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on that. But anyway, the federal SAMHSA uh, nominates uh, a week each year uh, to, to highlight prevention and to advocate for prevention uh, across the nation. Uh, so we are doing that here in Pennsylvania uh, with a, a series of events next week from Monday the 9th through the 13th. We want to highlight the importance of primary prevention, why it makes sense to get upstream and head off problem behaviors before they occur, rather than waiting until after they, they occur and deal with the ramifications of that. As part of that, we'll showcase the usefulness of the pay survey and the, the idea of data-driven decision-making, rather than just taking uh, what the, uh, the issue du, du jour, as I like to say, uh, what the issue of the moment is, uh, what are your kids telling you that should help focus where you take action? And then uh, discuss the impacts of our prevention efforts uh, in local communities by both our SCAs, or Sun County Authorities, and all the coalitions that we partner with over the years to uh, really help our kids, our families, and our communities. You can see the link there uh, for Prevention Week at CPA. Uh, please visit that. There's all kinds of resources and information, uh, and we'll have some highlights uh, after the events of next week posted there as well. So we'll move into the report content. Um, as you can see by the star, we're focusing on the profile report. But what we have here is kind of all the reports that, that will be available uh, over the course of uh, the next month or so. Uh, for uh, anyone that took the survey online, uh, we did release a preliminary highlights report, which came out uh, in December. 
Uh, this was the idea being getting information out into the hands of our schools and their partners as early as possible so they can start to take action on it instead of waiting till the end of this school year when the report just came out this week. The big thing with that report is it contained information about the impact of COVID-19 and the experience with remote learning. Um, so I would encourage you, if your district participated online, uh, to reach out to your administration, take a look at that, especially around those two areas. Uh, the profile report, uh, every school district or other school that took part received a local report with their summary data uh, directly to the superintendent or school administrator. Uh, the state does not receive copies of those reports. Uh, dissemination of those reports is controlled at the local level. Uh, it contains demographics, ATOD, um, antisocial behavior, school climate and safety, social and emotion, emotional health, uh, risk and protective factors, and some information about the social development strategy. Uh, we also pre prepared a uh, county level report for every county that had a minimum of two school districts participating. The idea being we do not want to single any individual district out. So you had to have two school districts in order to have a county level report. I believe we're going to end up with 57 county reports. We are currently working to get those posted. They'll be available on the PAYS website at www.pays.pa.gov, then click on 2021. There also is a uh, state um, sample report uh, in the same format as the local reports that will also be posted on that PAYS website. Uh, we're currently working on a uh, series of reports for all the IUs, uh, trying to bring them into our, our partnership, our um, work with all the school districts, uh, helping to, to see where we might be able to, to, to partner, uh, work together, help each other understand what's going on in each of the intermediate units and how the school districts that are part of those IUs uh, can really work to strengthen the work uh, and the, the focus of uh, what's being done through the IUs. I mentioned the All Questions, All Grade report. Uh, that also uh, is, uh, was sent out to the schools. Uh, it is a tabular report. Uh, again, we'll look for some feedback um, uh, later on, um, you know, in the, uh, the course of people analyzing that report and see how we can improve that moving forward. We have our annual full detailed report, we call it, which delves more deeply into the statewide data. This is often used at a state level where we're working with our partners at the Department of Education, uh, DDAP, Department of Health, the Attorney General's Office, uh, everyone interested in the in the uh, the work of prevention, uh, getting some trends, some analysis, some areas to focus on at a state level. So that will be coming out uh, probably late July, sometime over the summer. Uh, and then uh, the other thing we will prepare is kind of an analysis as to the highlights of what's included in our statewide data. Uh, that'll be uh, posted on the PAYS website as soon as we have a chance to do that analysis. So at this point, uh, we'll take we'll turn to uh, what are our trends telling us, and I'll flip it over to uh, to Mary. Hello, everyone. Thank you um, so much for joining us. Uh, we we it was with great pleasure that we sent out all of the profile reports um, at the district level, and then made county and state level reports available. Um, to PCCD on Monday. Uh, these reports, these data, as you all know, are um, they take a lot of work to gather. And so reporting them and sending out these reports is just a real joy. So um, as uh, Sophia mentioned, those reports did go out on Monday. Um, those are the process for that is those are sent directly to the superintendent that we have on record. And, and we always hope that that's the most current. Um, the survey coordinator um, who we worked with, if the um, uh, assuming that the superintendent didn't specifically designate that they wouldn't be allowed to get the results. And then also when we actually signed districts on for the survey, we offered superintendents the opportunity to name additional data users. So additional data users would have been on that email that uh, went out on Monday. If you do not fall within one of those categories, or honestly, if you just have not seen your email come in, um, you can access the data through our um, through the protocols that we have established. We want to make sure that districts feel um, clearly understand that they are the owners of their data. 
So they are the gatekeepers. So um, if you want to uh, become an additional data user, you would just need to either supply, um, supply some sort of written authorization from your superintendent, just a written note saying that you are can have access to data, or honestly, simply you could just reach out to your superintendent and ask if they might share the reports with you. So today I would like to, um, Sophia, can you, oh, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. And today, um, let's see, are you all seeing my screen? Okay, thank you. Um, today I would like to, yes, talk about some trends and some highlights, but first I would love to actually just show you the reports. Um, and kind of show you all of the features, all of the bells and whistles, um, and then give you a good sense of what we have. If you are new to looking at any of these reports, hopefully this is a big picture overview um, that will hopefully make the report seem less intimidating. Um, but let's go ahead and jump in. I pulled up um, two examples, our, our state level data and our county level data are publicly accessible. So uh, PCCD makes no uh, honestly, they, they post those data on their website. So we're going to look at two examples, one from both from Adams County. So we're going to look at an Adams County profile report, which is what we call um, like the general summary report. And then we're also going to look at the second report, which is that all questions by grade report, which includes just honestly a lot of data. So let's go through each of these and just kind of talk about what each contains, how you might use these, and, and to just how you might chip away at, at all the information there. So for um, the profile report, we always open up with um, just a note on where our funding comes from, our acknowledgments. Um, the table of contents, this is actually just a great overview of all the data that's contained in these um, wonderful profiles. So we have the demographics um, section, which not only tells you what the demographics of your uh, participants look like, um, but also kind of lets you know relative to enrollment, how, what was the successfulness of the survey within your area? So um, these are really important, uh, and I'll actually I'll show them more specifically in just a second. Um, the next section provides um, substance use data, so alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, we call that ATOD, um, will show uh, high prevalence and in early initiation drugs, prescription medications, other drugs. This section talks about risky substance use behavior like drinking and driving or driving after using marijuana, and then as well as access and willingness to use substances. When it comes to antisocial behavior, um, these largely focus on things like gambling, being suspended from school, et cetera. Um, we have a, a community and school climate and safety section, which focuses on commitment to school, involvement in pro-social activities, violence, bullying, um, et cetera. Social and emotional health, which includes mental health concerns, suicide risk, depression, um, bullying, uh, transitions and mobility, et cetera. For systemic factors, that focuses on perception of risk, um, parental disapproval, peer disapproval, attitudes, et cetera. And then uh, finally, our, our risk and protective factors section is at the end. And for those of you who, who do use this work for um, really valuable risk and protective factor based prevention planning, these data will help you to kind of put a story behind your data. So let's jump into just, um, in general, that's a big picture overview. I wanna give you just a little bit of an overview of how I feel that you should dive into this type of report. So oftentimes you're going to have a tremendous urge to just jump right to the data. And we would just say, you know, pause, do not pass go. We spend a little bit of time understanding who took the survey in your community. In this year, um, the survey was, or in this administration, the survey was administered in the fall of 2021. And we know that we were still in the thick of the pandemic by then. Um, students, um, students honestly weren't vaccinated at all. Um, teachers honestly at, at that point were also not vaccinated, correct? I don't know, time is all very relative. But we were still very much in the thick of the pandemic. Um, most students were taking the survey in schools, but we know that participation, um, participation did decrease a little bit um, in this administration relative to our 2019 administration. 
So we ask that you first spend some time looking at your participation. So looking at um, how many students were enrolled, how many surveys were gathered relative to how many students were enrolled and looking at relatively what was the overall success of the administration. Um, ideally, we ask, we, we like to hope that um, participation would be 60% or higher. Um, and so by studying participation, if you notice, for example, let's say you are from Adams County, let's say hypothetically um, one of these grades, and let me zoom in a little bit. Let's say hypothetically one of these grades um, actually showed a really dismal participation rate, maybe like 10% of students within the county actually took the survey. You might actually take that into account when you look at your data and interpret it, especially if in the previous administration, maybe the participation rate was 90%. Uh, knowing, understanding those changes and kind of understanding that looking at your data is going to allow you to put so much perspective um, and help you interpret it better. Um, the next thing you're going to focus on is, um, again, just kind of slowing down and understanding who took the survey again. So demographics are very important. It's important to study your demographics, particularly across administrations, and just see, okay, um, you know, how has participation changed over time? How does your 2021 participation compare to 2019? Did the pandemic negatively impact your participation or did actually participation increase this year? You shouldn't automatically assume that um, your numbers are worse this year than they were in previous years. Um, that is not always the case. So studying participation by grade, taking a look at, um, at your uh, gender data and then your race ethnicity data to kind of see, okay, are our findings significant? Did we miss any pockets of students? Do these demographics look like our student population? So your county level data, your district level data, et cetera, are not weighted at all. So the data, the, the surveys that we have are the data that you're going to see here. So understanding your participation is really important. Um, the next thing to do would be to just kind of dive in. Um, there's a lot of text if you are brand new to the survey or honestly if you need any help talking about the data. The texts are there to help you, to educate, to give you the words that you might need to communicate these findings. Um, and they are in general just designed to just sort of inform and educate. So um, this is an example of, of a section. So uh, we have ATOD use and access. Um, it's going to start with just kind of overall of the measurement. It's going to kind of define some terms that we're using. So it's going to define what lifetime use is and what 30 day use is. It's going to um, provide some information on any national comparison data that we might be using. And then within that section, you're going to find these subsections. So this is an example of a subsection for high prevalence early initiation drug um, data. It will give a little bit of an overview. It will specifically list the questions exactly as they were worded in the 2021 survey, and then also um, uh, just give a little bit of an overview on why those are important. And then when it comes to the charts, most of our charts look exactly like this. So there's a lot going on here. And again, if you are new to looking at these, this might be a little bit intimidating to you. But my suggestion is, is just to just take it a little bit at a time um, and to look at just a, a few things over and over and over again on every chart. So uh, for this chart, this is early initiation and higher prevalence drugs. This is lifetime use. So by lifetime use, we mean any use. Students said that they use this at least once in their lifetime. So lifetime use is more of a measure of experimentation. So um, I'm going to just take the time to see what I'm looking at. I'm looking at three years of data. I'm looking at data from 2017, 2019, and 2021. I know that the state um, comparison is a dot. And then I know that MTF, which stands for monitoring the future, is our national comparison. That's my national comparison. Um, all of the numbers that coincide with these are down here. And I know that these data are showing um, sixth grade data, eighth grade, 10th, 12th, and then all grades combined. So in general, for each of these charts, you're just looking for, again, a few things over and over and over again. You're looking for you know, what's high and what's low, what has changed over time, and what might be driving that. 
you're also looking at your data relative to the state and the nation. So um, honestly, the, the best way to do it is really just to eyeball it at first. So just eyeballing this, I can see alcohol use. More students are experimenting in uh, Adams County with alcohol use relative to marijuana or inhalants. I can see in terms of changes over time um, that uh, in terms of experimentation, my eighth and 10th graders in, in Adams County showed a decrease in experimentation, but my sixth and my 12th graders actually showed an increase in experimentation with alcohol. Um, again, just kind of looking across for just general changes, the experimentation of marijuana actually decreased for all of my grades. And then two, just again, eyeballing it, you can see that in Adams County in general, substance use rates, um, at least for alcohol, are higher than the state, um, often higher than the nation. However, for marijuana, the rates are, are much more comparable to the state level or lower than the state level. And they're also, for some grades, lower than the national level, at least. Uh, in addition to that. So um, again, we're just kind of looking for highs and lows, what's changed over time in your data relative to the state and the nation. And if you can just keep asking yourselves those four questions over and over and over again, every time you look at a chart, you're going to get the maximum um, interpretation from it. So that said, let me, I don't want to give you a headache, but let me zoom kind of through a lot of these data to our risk and protective factor section. Okay, so for the risk and protective factors, if you are using the risk and protective factor model to drive your prevention change, this section is a little bit different. There's a little bit more information um, that explains what the model is and, and how those uh, risk and protective factors link up with problem behavior. Um, all of the scales are going to be defined. So if you are curious about, well, laws and norms favorable to drug use, what does that mean? Uh, we provide a definition of it as well as cite all of the questions that feed into that. Um, keep this in mind because this actually will come into play also with the all questions by grade report. Um, after all of the scales are defined, there is a good amount of information on just simply how you use and interpret these data. Um, you're provided with just an overall snapshot of um, the risk, uh, risk factor scores or the percent of students at risk for each of these um, individual scales uh, at the community level, family, school, and peer individual level. Likewise, with protection, we want protection, we want risk to be low, we want protection to be high. So for protective factors, uh, we're looking at, we want to see these go as high as possible. So we're taking a look at scales that might have a really positive um, high uh, protective factor score. And then also the negative would be those protective factor uh, scores or scales that are low. And then honestly, the charts become almost exactly the same. So again, we're looking at three years of data. Uh, we're looking at data um, of uh, compared to the state and the nation. The biggest difference is for risk and protective factors, we look at one grade at a time. And the reason for that is oftentimes it's uh, risk for a sixth grade class is going to be so much different than risk for our 12th grades, 12th graders, right? So looking at these one grade at a time really allows you to just focus on that population of, of students at that age and that developmental stage in their life. So risk and protective factor data are always displayed by grade. Um, so you'll get the risk factor data immediately followed by protective factor data um, for, for the sixth grade. So again, you're just looking at what's high and what's low, what's changed over time, uh, how those data compare to the state and the nation. Um, and then in general, those again, are just the same questions that you're asking over and over and over again. Um, following, uh, following those charts, we do have tables that show that risk and protective factor data um, just in nice table formats. Um, there's background information. If you are a community that has a, a DFC grant, um, the data that you will need for your reporting um, can be found in Appendix A. Appendix B is where we just talk about some of the survey methodology as well as some question changes. Appendix C has a load of resources that we would hope that you would tap into and use. And Appendix D is where you're going to find a list of, if you're looking at a county report, you're going to find a list of all the districts that participated. 
If you're looking at a district report, you're going to find a list of all the schools that participated. So again, just like when you study your demographics and your participation, um, it's kind of studying who took the survey is just really important for your interpretation. So that is a really quick and dirty overview of the profile report. Let me switch to our brand new report this year, the All Questions by Grade report. So All Questions by Grade, it is named exactly what it is. It's going to show you every single question in the survey by grade. And not only that, it's going to provide you data um, from 2017, 2019, and 2021. It's going to provide you not only with the percentage, but also for the number of students who marked each response option for the survey. You can see that this is a 53-page report, which is largely made up of tables like this. And before you say, oh my gosh, there is no possible way I'm going to go through every single one of those data points, I would honestly probably confirm, yes, chances are you are not going to look at every single one of these data points. But this report serves a really valuable function, and that is to help you to take hopefully what is your curiosity that comes from your profile and dig in deeper. So oftentimes, one of the, a few of the reasons that we built a report like this were, uh, honestly, people would come up to us and say, sorry, do not mean to give you a headache. They would say, okay, friends use of drugs. Someone might say, you know what, our, our data for friends use of drugs, our risk for that increased dramatically. Um, can you tell us of the four questions that feed into this scale, you know, maybe were those data um, driven by friends' use of alcohol? Were they driven by friends' use of cigarettes? Were they driven by friends' use of marijuana? How did the data that feed into these scales provide, me provide meaning? Or how can we look at those data to provide meaning and then to look at those across, um, across categories? And so that's exactly what this type of report will allow you to do, is just to kind of take what you're curious about, and then actually to look at the very specific questions that feed into these and just study the data to see um, how students responded. So the or this all questions by grade report does include these um, kind of headings that help to break it down into chunks. And we have created these hyperlinks. So you could jump straight to community domain risk factors. You could jump straight to ATOD use and access. You could jump straight to school climate and safety and use those um, hyperlinks to help you jump through. Or as you scan through, just pay attention to these heading bars um, that are gonna let you know, okay, these are the questions that uh, kind of feed within this category. Um, so let's use actually that, that example that I was just referring to. Friends, let's see. Okay, wait, friend perception of use, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to find exactly the one I want. Friends use. Okay, friends use of drugs. So um, let's say I had that hypothetical question. Okay, which of these questions was really driving uh, maybe our scale for that? I can take a look and honestly, I'm just going to eyeball this. Let me actually do really fast. Let me pull up like a highlighter. Um, and let's say that I am going to, actually that's not gonna work. Okay, sorry, I thought I was gonna be really smart and just highlight some stuff, but let's say that I do want to look at um, just total data for, um, for this item. So here we have data for um, friends that have used um, beer, wine, or alcohol, uh, friends that have smoked cigarettes, friends that have used LSE, and friends that have used marijuana. And I know that for these, um, the, the percent of students who said none, none of my friends have used, is always first. So honestly, I, that's the one that I want to be the highest as possible. So I can say, okay, well, not many students, or 95.8% of students uh, within Adams County uh, across all grades, 95.8% of students said, you know, none of my friends are using these heavy substances. However, 
Um, 90%, um, so 90%, so 10% are using smoking um, cigarettes. 72.9% um, um, of friends have not um, used alcohol. So again, the opposite of that is that's over, over 25%. And then when it comes to using marijuana, um, it, it's comparable. It's 82% um, have not used, uh, friends have not used marijuana. So I know for a fact that looking at this data that it's not the heavy substance use that's really driving this. And it's not really even um, having friends that smoke cigarettes. It's really having friends that have used alcohol and marijuana that's really driving those data. So that is just one example. But two, when it comes to even just looking at the responses, this can be a really great way to, again, allow you to follow your curiosity. So let's say that you are focused on alcohol use and you, um, you find that within our high prevalence early initiation drugs. Um, so here you can see there's the questions, how many times in your lifetime have you used beer, wine, or hard liquor? And then how many times in the past 30 days have you used as well? So in the profile reports, we just rolled this data into a simple use or no use. That's all that you see. And honestly, you don't even see no use. You only see one data point, and that is any student who used any number of times. However, the way that we ask this question is actually to ask students, how many times did you use? Did you use zero times? Did you use one or two, three to five. So honestly, there's really powerful data here about frequency and intensity. So let's say you were doing some really hardcore, very specific substance use related uh, prevention planning, and you were worried about bench drinking, you were worried about students that were, um, were using to tremendous excess in, in terms of danger. You could take a look at, and see what, um, what percent of students um, honestly are only using one or two times main, maybe in their lifetime, the percent of students that are definitely heavier users or more extreme users. And then you can also study how that's changed over time. So let's say within a community, uh, maybe you know four years ago, um, the community wasn't really reporting a whole lot of um, just tremendous um, dangerous uh, substance use. Um, there weren't a lot of ER visits, but all of a sudden, let's say hypothetically in 2021, oh my gosh, you've got a lot of kids going to the emergency room um, for, uh, for overdose or overuse. Um, and so you could pull up these data and kind of study the progression or the change of this over time. So you can see I'm using a lot of words in terms of like curiosity, kind of study. And this really is a tool that you may or may not use it but I would encourage you to look at your profile report. And when you're looking at this, in addition to looking at what's high and what's low, what's changed over time, what's higher than the state or higher than the nation, I would also ask you to just ask yourself for every chart, what am I curious about here? Or what is this chart not telling me that I would like to know and study further and maybe make a note of that and have that be something that would point to you to the all questions by grade report to dig in deeper and to kind of follow that curiosity and use all of this data which is really at your fingertips to use all of this data to help you to tell a bigger and broader um, data story uh, which is what I like to, to call it when we're just talking about data and interpreting it and using it. So that said, that is a really quick overview of those reports. I do want to talk just a little bit about a few trends, um, particularly trends that you might find surprising. Um, if you have looked at the data, you might have already noticed these. Um, some of the biggest changes that we have found, um, or at least some of the biggest differences that uh, we're looking at. These are state level data. So um, here we've got state of Pennsylvania data. Again, this is lifetime. So this is experimental use of alcohol, marijuana, and inhalants. Um, and then next we have 30 day use. So this is more of a regular use of these same substances um, within the past 30 days. You might have noticed one thing about these in terms of um, 
Again, you know, in terms of what's high and what's low, alcohol is higher in the state than marijuana. It's the same uh, when it comes to 30 day use, alcohol use is actually more comparable to marijuana use. Um, in some of your communities, you'll probably find that marijuana use is actually used more frequently or higher than alcohol use. But that's not the big story here. The big story is that across most substances, we did see from 2019 to 2021, a decrease in use, a decrease in reported use. Um, particularly for um, substances that are a little bit more difficult for students to get, like alcohol, marijuana, and things like that. Inhalant use is actually one of the substances that didn't really change a whole lot. And actually in some grades, like sixth grade, we actually saw a slight increase in inhalant use. I think a lot of that has to do, honestly, a lot of this overall does, perhaps I do not want to speculate because we will know so much more in 2023. Um, but I feel like a lot of these decreases could be um, at play because of the pandemic. And the reason why we, we believe this is when you look at the risk and protective factor data, particularly within the peer individual domain, you'll find that overwhelmingly students were lower at risk in 2021 for friends use of drugs, for interactions with antisocial peers, um, and, and for um, availability of substances. Um, I honestly, I can, I, I will not, I'm not a betting woman, but in general, I would encourage you to go to your risk and protective factor data in the back and to see if your data follows that trend in terms of students having less availability to substances, students hanging out with, uh, with antisocial peers at a lower rate. And then two, follow your all questions by grade data and kind of understand those more specifically. But in other states that Bach Harrison is working with, we're seeing similar trends, both a decrease in risk in terms of availability and access to antisocial peers, but then also a, likewise a decrease in substance use for most substances. So um, that is at play. Um, this is not surprising to me. It was surprising. The first state we looked at these data, this was, it was surprising. But at this point, we've looked at so many states of data that have collected during the pandemic, kind of a pre-post. For the pandemic and we're kind of we're, we're seeing that this is a really common trend at the national level too substance use decreased um, as well from our our national comparisons so that is one of um one of the more surprising findings i will be curious in 2023 to see if these data quote unquote normalize or or go back up a little bit once um kind of interactions are, are normalized a little bit or if perhaps this could be the new normal. What if this was just a big, um, a, a big blip that just sort of continues on? Um, a lot of the data that, a lot of what we're asking you to do when you look at your data and interpret it is to just kind of, again, like slow your roll a little bit and just uh, realize that it's gonna take time to understand what the impacts of the pandemic were on students. And so we're just asking you to approach your data with a lot of curiosity, um, and just a lot of um, trying, we encourage you to try to make those connections and think about it, but to not necessarily chalk things up to the pandemic. That's not another um, surprising finding was um, trends that we've seen across the board. And again, apologies for this. Um, things such as when it comes to bullying, um, you, in general, we have seen a decrease in bullying in school, but also in general, um, more grades are showing an increase, a significant increase in cyberbullying. So that's another thing that honestly makes a little bit of sense, right? Um, during the pandemic, we had more students on devices. We had more schools um, putting devices in students' hands. We had more one-to-one -one device schools than we ever have in our entire history. Um, so a lot of uh, these data make sense. In the state of Utah, we actually ask a few questions about um, screen time. Not surprisingly, that state showed a tremendous increase in screen time from 2019 to 2021. So it kind of makes sense that if students are spending more time on their devices right now, that a lot of the bullying might shift from in school to kind of that cyber format. Um, the last trend I want to point out just comes with uh, mental health concerns. Um, these are right here. These are our um, uh, past year self-harm, feeling depressed or sad most days in the past 12 months, 
feeling that sometimes I think life is not worth it, or at times I think I'm no good. All in all, I'm inclined to feel I'm a failure. Um, just like in general, a big finding was, okay, across most substances, if not all substances, we saw a, just a, a really predictable and, and just kind of steady decrease um, across all grades. The reverse is, uh, it, for that is, um, or the reverse, for mental health, it's the reverse of that, where in general, do not be surprised to see your mental health go in a direction that you did not want it to go. And this is another thing too that I am curious in 2023 to see if this also normalizes, if this will go back to kind of pre-pandemic mental health levels, um, or if this is also here to stay. This is something, again, 2023 data, I am going to be anticipating those even more than how much I anticipated this year's data, just because I'm excited to see how, uh, if, if, they will change or go back again um, in a different direction. Likewise, when it comes to suicide risk, so you know, did you uh, were you so sad you stopped doing uh, usual activities? Did you seriously consider suicide? Did you plan a suicide? Um, did you attempt suicide one or more times? Did you need medical treatment for that? Some of the positive gains that we got in 2019, we saw a lot of these um, these. Um, we saw a lot of positive changes from 2017 to 2019 in, in terms of mental health. Unfortunately, these data have returned um, back to what it was in 2017, if not shown an increase. And so this is another trend in general that we've seen that um, you, I, it would not be surprising to see these um, in some of your data as well. So that is uh, where I will stop. This leads us, I will honestly, I'll stop sharing and hand it back over to Jeff. Um, and I'll take questions at the end, I believe. All right. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, what Mary. a great Thank overview. Um, I think we, you know, Mary highlighted some of the things we've, we've seen in our initial review of the data. Um, and one of the things that, that we've kind of uh, started advising the field is the data is what the data is. Um, we don't know what the impact of the pandemic is, um, but this is what our kids are telling us that they experienced over the last, um, I guess, 18 months now uh, when they started taking the survey uh, in September through November. Um, so I think what we wanted to uh, kind of move into is what do we do next? Um, the data's out there. Uh, the big fear we always have when uh, we that, that work on the pays is that the reports are going to be nice and pretty and, and un, uh, unbroken and, and sitting on a shelf. So it's time for people to, to really delve in and start to see what the kids are reporting. Uh, we encourage you to build, uh, continue to build your team. If you've not done so in the past, uh, Epis and PCD can help you with that. But we always, always encourage people, no one person should be looking at the data. Um, the divide and conquer um, cliche actually works here. Uh, break it up into sections. Someone look at the uh, the, the frequently used sections, uh, substances section. Someone look at the, the perceptions of risk. Someone look at mental health. Um, so getting your team together, getting people that have those interests, and then coming back together and saying what they found as part of that analysis uh, really can help the, the coalition the, and their school partners determine where they need to take action. Uh, as in the past, we will have the, uh, the PAYS guide, the how-to guide, uh, is currently being updated. That will be available on the EPIS website, uh, under the PAYS section on that website. That, if you're not familiar with it, is a guide that will basically walk you through all the steps you should take to interpret your data. It will help you figure out who should be on that team I just mentioned to help you do that analysis. Also on the uh, EPIS website, under the PAYS section, we're in the process of crafting new materials and tools. Uh, through the, the graciousness of the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs, we were able to add uh, some consultants to do some of that dedicated work around putting that data to use. Uh, we'll also next year be looking to do some assistance, uh, materials to assist with the implementation of the 2023 administration through that uh, support from DDAP. Uh, but for now, please keep an eye out on that EPIS website. For more information, more tools, 
more recommendations, case studies, whatever it may be, uh, things that we believe are value add to the field that can really help you interpret and take action upon the PAYS data. And then as I mentioned back at the beginning, just another shout out for Prevention Week, um, we would encourage you uh, to do this outreach, to make sure that the people that are making decisions in your local communities, at the state level, uh, understand that, that we have this data resource. We have uh, information directly from our kids, what they think, what they know, and what they believe about substances and other problem behaviors. So if they're not uh, familiar with this, I would encourage you to share it. Um, your, your state representatives, take a, a trip down to their district office and say, are you familiar with the PACE data? If not, do you have a moment? Let me show you what our kids are telling us. Um, everyone uh, that's involved in government is here to make the, the lives of the Commonwealth citizens better. And that starts with our kids. It starts with our families. And, it, and be, by helping our kids and families, we have stronger, better communities. So there is a lot of, of uh, possible allies out there. And we would encourage you to build off of what the PAYS data is, to take action, to take steps that can really advance prevention throughout the Commonwealth uh, and, and really help us um, stress the importance of early upstream prevention. Uh, we can wait till kids are involved in the juvenile justice system or children and youth or drop out of school or get uh, become pregnant. Um, or we can take action to help provide those pro-social opportunities, those supports, those protective factors that we know can buffer the kids from risk. Um, this is the, the heart of the social development strategy, the heart of communities that care. And it's what PCCD has supported uh, going back to the mid nineties. Um, so that's, kind of where I'll leave it with the, the take action. We're here to help you. Please reach out to PCCD, reach out to your single county authorities, reach out to your schools, uh, and always reach out to EPIS. They are a huge ally and a huge resource to help you uh, take action to really uh, get the most out of what, what the PACE data is telling us. So I'll pause there. Um, do we have questions? Jeff, anything that we didn't get answered? There were a lot of questions in chat. So first, thanks so much for all of the amazing questions and and everybody's you know interest in this topic. I don't think that I have any jotted down that weren't answered. Uh, you guys were doing a great job answering them. And also I saw a number answered in chat. At this time, if you had a question and it didn't get answered, please feel free to, to pose it in chat now or if it will let you unmute because I don't know of any that are missed at this time. Yeah, I did see some questions around ordering special reports. Uh, the link for that order uh, form will be posted on the PAYS website. Again, www.pays.pa.gov then click on 2021. Uh, so if you're a coalition that works with multiple school districts and you, know, you want to report for all the kids that you serve through your coalition, go to that special report. Bach Harrison will work with you uh, for a minimal fee. They can prepare those reports for you. Uh, if you want building level data, if you have two high schools in your area, uh, reach out to Buck Harrison. They can work with you to get the, uh, the correct permissions to help you do that analysis where we know one, um, one part of a community may be facing different uh, issues than another part of the community. Uh, to help you better target your prevention efforts, uh, that's where we can kind of help you break that, that data down. Awesome, yeah. If anybody would like to unmute, you can do that as well. Um, or even if you wanna share your answer to this question that we have on the slide, how do you plan to use your PAYS reports? Uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. All right, well, if there's no one, um, no other questions and no one um, wanting to share, we can just continue on. Feel free to reach out to any of us and if you have any questions, um, we're happy to help. Absolutely. So just to give you an update, uh, we hope you've enjoyed these, these first Wednesday at one series. We intend to keep doing this as long as we have people interested in attending. So um, you can see the next uh, one we scheduled for June 1st. 
Uh, it's kind of a, a chance to um, do what Sophia just mentioned. Uh, if you, you start to delve into your report and you're scratching your head, uh, here's a chance to, to, to put some questions out there. Uh, maybe your, your peers can answer it, something they've seen when they've done their work. Uh, you need help uh, engaging with different sectors, um, chance to troubleshoot whatever you're, you're trying to do. There's a chance to do that on June 1st. We also will give you an update on the uh, material leases, what we have available um, and where you can access it and how you might be able to use it. Uh, we did uh, postpone the July 6th one. Uh, we just thought that's right after the 4th of July. We think a lot of people are gonna be taking uh, with the 4th on a Monday, probably taking some leave that week. Uh, so we decided not to hold the webinar that week. So we are moving our training on the, uh, the new crosstab tool uh, until August the 3rd. Uh, again, this is when people will really start to be in the, the back to school mindset and, and uh, time frame. So we think that's a good time to roll that out, really help people uh, understand and, and uh, be able to utilize that tool. Uh, for those that are familiar, uh, for the last several administrations, we've had the ability to compare data uh, two data variables, uh, let's say the, uh, num the students that reported being bullied uh, and their level of alcohol use over the last 30 days. We've had that capability at the state and at the county level through the Bach Harrison web tool available through the PAYS website. This year, we're going to make that available at the district level. Uh, we will uh, have the kind of the gatekeeper be the superintendent or the school administrator. More information on how to access that will be uh, forthcoming later this summer. Uh, but we believe this is going to be a great value add, especially for people that like to roll up their sleeve and, and really analyze data. Here's a, a chance for you to really do that, to really see the connection between the responses that our students have. Um, so that's what's, uh, what's coming up. Uh, you can see at the bottom of this page, if you do have questions uh, over the next several weeks, uh, over the next several months as you're moving forward, uh, please uh, use that link um, to, um, uh, to to submit a question to Pays. The, the Qualtrics link at the bottom, submit a question about Pays. Uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, if it's of uh, a lot of interest, we're, we're uh, working to develop an, an FAQ around issues that we believe will be of, of uh of, of common uh, interest, common need across the, uh, the, the Commonwealth. Um, so that also will be posted on the, the EPA site and probably on the PACE site as well. We're still kind of working through that process. So that's a, a work under development, but, but um, the more feedback we get, the more questions we get from the field, uh, the more that helps us kind of do our job and help us uh, make PACE as useful and as beneficial as possible. So, Sophia, you want to take us home? Yeah, well, thank you, everyone um, who was able to join us today. Um, we really appreciate you just being a part of this webinar and giving us feedback. Um, so I will post a link in the chat where you can um, just share with us your feedback on this webinar, add any um, future topics that you would like to see. Um, we are planning to hopefully continue these um, next year um, with new topics and um, just more support for you guys in your pays and prevention efforts. Um, make sure you follow us on social media. Um, you'll receive a lot of updates on uh, the pays guide, which will be coming out soon, um, and any other updates around pays and uh, prevention week and things like that. Um, so yeah, we'd love to just stay connected with you guys and the work that you do. Sophia, we did have a question from uh, Kareem Tynes. Um, who can I direct our superintendent to for a meeting to learn more about PAYS? Um, I would suggest starting off with that, that next webinar, June 1st, um, either the superintendent or, or someone that they want to designate could attend that and ask any questions they may have. Uh, also the, the, the guide and, and some of that other information, but PCCD and EPIS, are, are available to come out and speak to, to individual school districts. Uh, typically, we've, we've been doing that virtually. Uh, hopefully, I think we all are of the mindset that, that uh, we're, we're nearing uh, the, at least the crest of this, uh, this, this situation and we can get out uh, more face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, but we'd be happy to set up a time to help any school district, any school, any community, any county understand and work with this data. We believe this data is vital to inform the decisions being made, what programs are chosen, where funding should go, how do we address 
problems before they occur rather than spending all of our money on recovery beds or on sending kids to juvenile delinquency placements. All those sorts of issues can be headed off before they get there. If we understand how to help our kids, what supports they need, and how to engage all the adults that are involved in, in a kid's life uh, in a positive way. The social development strategy is another huge uh, thing to share with, with a lot of our superintendents that may not understand that. Schools don't do it alone. Uh, Pays is given in the schools because that's where our kids are. It's not a reflection on the school. It takes every single adult that's engaged with a kid to help them grow up successfully. And that's what we're trying to do uh, through our prevention efforts. And again, Prevention Week next week, uh, more to come. You'll hear some of the same things I just said. I worked on, uh, my executive director will be speaking and uh, a lot of what I've, I uh, just said today was uh, in the, 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 uh, the remarks I prepared for him. It's kind of why they're fresh in my, in my mind. So thank you very much.